Well, good afternoon, Helsinki. It, it is an incredible privilege to be here today speaking with you. And I have an important question to ask you. What is the key to sustainable high performance? But before then, I feel compelled to explain what I'm wearing on my head. This is an EEG headset. During today's presentation, I'm going to be using it to record my rhythms of stress and focus. Later in the presentation, we'll return to that recording and see what we can learn. But until then, I'd ask you to shift your focus. I'll tell you how this all began. 15 years ago, I was a full-time racing cyclist. I'd moved to France to pursue my dream of becoming a professional cyclist. And it was then that my passion and interest in measuring and improving human performance first began to grow and accelerate. Unfortunately, my cycling career didn't quite reach the heights that I hoped, but I returned to the UK, I studied sports science, and eventually set up my own coaching business. During this time, three important things happened. Three important things which were driven by the fact that many of my clients were actually amateur road cyclists, but they had very demanding jobs as well. They were finance professionals and solicitors and architects. And for some reason, outside of their very demanding jobs, they also pursued very challenging cycling events. The first thing that happened was that I became fascinated with knowledge work. I started to wonder what was going on during my client's workday. Second, I started to use tools and frameworks from sports science to try and understand knowledge work better. And finally, I had a revelation. I realized that knowledge work is an endurance activity. And that inspired a lot of my work and research today. I'm actually doing my PhD at the moment, looking specifically at knowledge workers and their daily rhythms of sleep, of stress, and of cognitive performance. So, what is the key to sustainable high performance? Well, if you're among the 79% of people who checked their smartphone within 15 minutes of waking up this morning, I'm afraid you haven't found the key. If you're among the 42% who admit to using email in the bathroom, I'm afraid you haven't found it either. You know, the average knowledge worker is interrupted once every 11 minutes. We check in on communication tools once every six minutes. What do we do? at the end of that demanding day to relax. Well, maybe we sit on the sofa, we put something on the big screen, we watch TV, but we seem incapable of watching TV in isolation anymore. We have to switch between that big screen, our smartphone and our tablet computer an average of 21 times per hour. We're never resting. We're rarely focused. We're always on. But we can't always be on. And this truth is particularly apparent in endurance sport. I'm going to share some ideas with you from endurance sport that I think apply equally well to the endurance activity of knowledge work. You see, in endurance sport, you have to be careful to apply your effort in the right place at the right time to avoid being exhausted. And anyone who engages in any kind of endurance sport is probably familiar with the idea of intensity zones. Simply put, imagine there are three intensity zones. A low intensity zone, where if you're a cyclist, you can ride slow for a long time. A medium intensity zone, where we can ride at a moderate pace for a medium amount of time. And then a high intensity zone, where we can ride very fast, but only for a short amount of time. And we use these intensity zones to create a plan for physical endurance. I'd like to introduce you to a cyclist that I've been working with for a few years now. Her name is Claire Jones. She's a master's road cyclist. By day, she's a finance professional. Outside of her work, she pursues demanding cycling events. And in particular, she's been targeting an event called the Etape de Tour. Each year, it provides the opportunity for amateur cyclists to ride a stage of the Tour de France just a few days before the professionals. In 2017, we were convinced that the route suited her particularly well, particularly that final climb to the cold Isoard. So we created a plan for physical endurance based around those zones so she would be at her best for that final climb.
Claire's aim was to finish in the top 20. So after the event, started to look at the data. Claire finished the event in just under seven hours. She expended 4,500 kilojoules of energy. That's equivalent to 14.5 cheeseburgers. But unfortunately, she was way outside her target. She only finished 54th. I said I'd look into the data to see what I could find, and it was quite revealing. She made some efforts early on when she should have taken it easy, and it compromised her performance when she should have been at her best. Basically, she put her effort in the wrong place at the wrong time. She didn't rest where she, she was supposed to. She followed someone else's rhythm instead of her own. But Claire isn't the kind of person to give up. She decided to go back in 2018. However, this time, she was very clear about where to focus effort. She knew very clearly where to take some rest. Perhaps most importantly, she was committed to find and follow her own rhythm, paying attention to when she was at her best. Claire finished the event in just under seven hours, expended a similar amount of energy, but as soon as I looked at the data, I could see that the performance was very different. She performed at her best for that final climb, and in fact, she finished way inside the top 20 target. She was actually third in her age group. It was her best result in the attack ever. I think there are three lessons that we can take from this endurance cycling performance that apply equally well to the endurance activity of knowledge work. These are, we can achieve better results for similar effort if we apply the effort in the right place at the right time. Secondly, we need to be disciplined to rest and recover, even if we don't feel like it. Finally, perhaps most importantly, we need to find and follow our own rhythm, pay attention to when we are at our best. But we're fortunate because cycling performance is quite easy to measure. In contrast, cognitive performance is a bit more challenging to record. We rarely consider rhythms in cognitive performance. But whether we consider those rhythms or not, cognitive performance actually varies by about 20% during the average day. Around 20% of the population, we might call these people early birds, experience this variation as a peak, a valley, and a rebound. These people generally prefer mornings. Another 20% of the population, we might call these people owls, they feel at their best in the evening, later into the day. They experience their day as a rebound, then this valley followed by a peak. Another 60% of the population are somewhere in between. But whether you're an early bird or an owl, actually, these three phases have distinct characteristics. That peak is the best time for focus, for analysis, and productivity. That valley is the best time for rest, for recovery and reflection. And that rebound is a great opportunity for those menial tasks and the switching work that characterizes at least part of most knowledge workers' day. But we're not paying attention to those rhythms. And this is a problem, because we're likely limiting our cognitive performance as a result. And this is perhaps even more of a problem, because human cognitive capabilities are going to become an increasingly important differentiator in the future of work. In most occupations, 30% of the work could already be automated. But as a human performance scientist, I'm fascinated with that other 70%, the 70% that is likely to be characterized by our most human capabilities, capabilities such as complex problem solving, collaboration, creativity. But these capabilities, they will not be expressed at their best with our current ways of living and working. These capabilities are the output of a rested and focused brain. Perhaps the real danger isn't that machines and artificial intelligence are going to start working more like humans, it's that we humans will keep trying to work like machines. We can't always be on. We need more human rhythms of work and rest, being clear about where to focus effort, knowing when to rest, finding and following our own rhythm. Optimize. Don't maximize. Dr. Aki Hintzer, the founder of Hintzer Performance, shared this quote with me early on when I joined the company. And he had a big influence on my career. And in fact, this quote has inspired much of my research. Recently, 
I conducted a study to try and understand more about what optimal work could look like in the context of knowledge work. To do this, I recruited 100 knowledge workers. I tracked them for 14 days, and during that time, I looked in particular at these daily rhythms in sleep, in stress, and in cognitive performance. You should be able to see this graph, which shows these daily variations in cognitive performance on average. But I was actually interested in what is driving these variations. Well, it turns out, perhaps unsurprisingly, that stress and sleep are some of the biggest drivers of cognitive performance. And while I'd love to dig into the data in more detail, the summary is people who follow rhythms of work and rest both feel better and perform better. If you're too stressed and you're sleep deprived, it's unlikely that you're performing sustainably. What a surprise. Did you know that after 18 hours of wakefulness, that's equivalent to working from 8 a.m. to 2 a.m., your cognitive performance is equivalent to being legally drunk in most European countries? Inadequate sleep may be costing the Nordic economy 18 billion euros per year. It's estimated that work-related stress could be costing the European economy 136 billion euros, and work-related stress may be responsible for one-fifth of staff turnover. We can't always be on. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, I'd be recording my own brain activity, in particular my levels of stress and focus. And if this demonstration works, in a moment, I'm going to show you that recording, I'm going to switch workspaces, and we'll see what we can find out. OK, take a look at that red line. See the peak in stress at the beginning of this demonstration? Take a look at that yellow line, continuous rhythms in focus. Take a look at the bottom window that actually shows the recording from early on in the presentation. There's one thing that I want you to take away from this demonstration. It's this. Even during what is perhaps the most demanding 15 minutes of my speaking career so far, I couldn't always be on. I couldn't always be focused. Thankfully, I couldn't always be stressed. Now, perhaps you don't wear one of these EEG headsets routinely, but are you aware of your rhythms? Do you work with them? Do you work against them? Do you ignore them completely? We need a framework to plan for cognitive endurance. And inspired by that simple structure to plan for physical endurance in endurance sport based on those zones, I came up with a plan, a plan for cognitive endurance that I call cognitive gears. So imagine for a moment there is a low cognitive gear that's characterized by times of rest, recovery, and reflection. There is a medium cognitive gear and a high cognitive gear characterized by times of focus for analysis and productivity. But think for a moment about that medium cognitive gear, those menial tasks and the switching work that characterizes at least most of knowledge workers' days. If you think about your average day in the context of those three gears, how do you spend your time? The majority of us find that we spend most of our day stuck in a cognitive middle gear. A middle gear that is characterized by being caught in pseudo work and switching, feeling stressed and on someone else's schedule, pulling our phone out at every opportunity that makes it harder to switch into high gear and down into low gear when we really need to. So what's the solution? Because our schedules feel packed, we've got back-to-back -back meetings, we're answering phone calls in the middle of the night. Well, I think it begins quite simply by making a commitment to not make perfect an enemy of good enough. And maybe start with an experiment. This could be an experiment that you do at an individual level. It could be an experiment that you do at an organizational level. But whatever the case, as we approach the finish line today, I'm going to share some practical ideas to take this theory and put it into action. The first ideas are for that high cognitive gear where to focus your effort. Begin by scheduling that high gear work with the peak in your day. Pay attention to when you are at your best. During this time, experiment with working 25 minutes on, five minutes off, rather than checking your communication tools once every six minutes. Engineer an environment for focus. 
As leaders, we have a responsibility to engineer an environment for focus for our teams which minimizes distraction and interruption. For that low cognitive gear, when to take a rest? We'll begin by scheduling rest and reflection for the valley in your day. Remember, the most effective breaks are active, social, and natural. Go for a walk with someone that you like, look at the trees. Once upon a time, I think it was called a lunch break. Finally, sleep seven to nine hours per night. As leaders, try to create an environment and rhythm that means your team, on average, can sleep seven to nine hours per night because sleep is one of the most effective performance enhancers that we have available. And for that middle cognitive gear, how do you find and follow your own rhythm? We'll begin by putting some boundaries around those switching tasks. Synchronize those menial tasks with the rebound in your day. And don't be among the 79% of people who start their day by checking their email, because starting the day with email is starting on someone else's schedule. Adequate sleep, manageable stress, could result in 10 to 15% better cognitive performance. Improving employee well-being is estimated to result in productivity improvements of 19%. If individuals who slept under six hours started to sleep adequately, it could be worth 13 billion euros per year to the Nordic economy. And the effect on the individual could be real focus, reduced stress, enhanced recovery. Well-being is set to become a business value of strategic importance. So what is the key to sustainable high performance? Well, I actually think there are three. The first is to be clear about where to focus your effort. Secondly, it's to be disciplined about when and where to rest. And finally, perhaps most importantly, find and follow your own rhythm. Pay attention to when you are at your best. Knowledge work, it's an endurance activity. Thank you.